there, everybody. This is Tiffany Grant, best known as Oscar Langley, so are you, and sometimes Shikinami from Neon Genesis Evangelion and the Evangelion uh, Rebuild films. And AJ has asked me to come along and answer some questions for you uh, because you may know, but it's the 25th anniversary coming up very soon of the first release of Neon Genesis Evangelion on Japanese TV. So here we go. Uh, Eva has been around now for 25 years almost, and uh, you know, people have asked me many times over the years if I ever thought uh, we'd still be talking about Evangelion after all this time. The answer is no. <laughs> um, I thought, you know, it looked like a cool show and everything when we started working on it, but I had certainly no reason to ever guess that it was going to have this kind of an impact so that has been um, definitely a pleasant surprise to me that people have really gravitated towards the show and have been so enthusiastic and indeed passionate about it over the years so it's been really a privilege for me to be part of something that is really meaningful to a lot of people and I do take that um, I do really take that to heart I take that very seriously as a um, something that I need to respect and safeguard. So my very first exposure to Evangelion, actually, um, I had been working in anime for um, close to three years, probably. And my, my start was back in February of 1994. And so um, AD Vision, ADV Films, they had started dubbing the series back sometime like in uh, the fall or winter uh, late 1996 and uh, back then anime came out on VHS tapes two episodes at a time and Asuka does not get introduced into the show until episode eight so I was in the studio one day to record something else and I saw that the engineer was mixing or editing uh, doing some work on this show and I did not recognize what it was well what are you working on I asked him because I thought I'm not in this show what is it <laughs> you know so that was my first exposure to Evangelion was seeing that and he told me what it was so you know what I just marched myself right into Matt Greenfield's office and he was the person who wrote and directed and produced the original English dub of uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion and I went into his office and I said hey yeah I, I heard you guys are working on this new show and I'm not in that so <laughs> what's up with that uh can I can I work on it can I be in an episode and he was like no 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 you, you there's a character that you're going to be playing but she she hasn't been introduced in this show yet and he had this Oscar figure in his office so he was pointed to her that girl in the red and that's your character, but you just have to be patient, you know, and you'll come in and work on it in a couple months or something. And I was like, well, you know, could I just maybe I, I could just come and do like some bit parts or some background roles or supporting character or whatever. And he goes, no, Tiffany, you have to wait until your character is introduced. I'm like, well, okay, I guess she's not a very important character if she's not in the show yet. So womp womp. And it was pointed out to me a few months ago that, like, wait, you weren't in the show yet, and you went in and demanded to work on Evangelion. It's such an Oscar thing to do. It is. It really is. But, uh, you know, maybe that's why I got the part. So uh, the truth is that uh, I never auditioned for the part of Oscar, like specifically an audition where you're called into the studio and they give you a script and you read the script while you're looking at the show. No, I never did that. So my audition was... I guess the other parts that I'd already played, um, like Maki in the original Burn Up OVA and uh, Kome Sawaguchi in Blue Seed, and there were some pretty uh, sassy gals, you know. And apparently, when they had first started working on the show, or even before they started dubbing it, people who worked it at, at uh, ADV kept coming into Matt's office and saying, "So Tiffany's playing Asuka, right? She's playing Asuka." <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know I guess it was just kind of preordained because I I didn't even know I was completely unaware that they had had auditions for all of these other parts like 
Ray and uh, Misato and a lot of auditions for Shinji, a lot. They didn't know if it was going to be a, a guy or a woman playing the role. Um, anyway, but that is the true story of how um, I originally became involved with Evangelion and how I got the role of Asuka. Um, as I said, we started working on it, or they, because they were working on it before I was, but, um, you know, Matt and Amanda Wynn, um, as, as she was known at the time before she was Wynn Lee, uh, they were um, co-directing the early episodes of the show, so that was sometime around late 1996 that they started working on it. I came in probably early 1997 or so, I don't remember exactly, and it was probably over the course of about a year that um, it was dubbed. Again, just two episodes at a time. So they'd produce those two episodes that were going to come out on that VHS tape. And then we'd work on, a, you know, like a burn-up OVA or um, something like that. We would kind of go back and forth working on different things. So that was all done at the um, ADV Studios in Houston, Texas. So that is where we dubbed the whole thing. And, you know, I, I did really gravitate to Asuka right away. Um, like I said, didn't really specifically audition for the part. I just kind of was Asuka. So I, I did make a connection to her right away. Um, one of the things about the show when Matt Greenfield was directing us in it is only a couple of people really knew kind of what was going on in the show. So Amanda, because she was co-directing and also because she was Ray. Um, Aaron Crone, who was playing Kaji, who always knew a lot more than what everybody else did. Um, but, you know, oh, um, Sue Ulu, who played Ritsko, and Trista McAvery, who was Gendo. But most of the people in the cast, like me, um, Spike Spencer, who was playing Shinji, um, Allison Keith, who was playing Misato. I mean, our characters did not really know what was going on at Nerve, and so we didn't either. And so that was a, a technique that was very much employed. But I, I was drawn to Asuka and her brokenness as that uh, became uh, more revealed. And one of the funny little coincidences about the show is that I could speak German. And so I guess that's also just part of the kismet that um, I had taken German in high school and in college and really um, just gravitated towards it. I don't know, I, I liked it a lot. Uh, and I was at one point back when I was in college and for several years afterwards, um, like when we were dubbing Evangelion, I was pretty good. I was pretty conversationally fluent in German. I've, lost a little bit of it over the years but um it's not ganz gut so it's I still I still can speak uh I still can speak it a little bit and uh that was you know I guess just one of the uh the cherry on top of the Sunday that I could actually speak it um of course people ask me about that all the time and I do get asked about my favorite lines from the show. Um, Asuka's got a lot of great um, quotes. Of course, her trademark uh, line that she always says is, uh, what are you, stupid? Uh, which was on Tabaka in, in the original Japanese. But that's, you know, that's a classic Asuka. I mean, Asuka's got so many great quotes. So one that I get requested a lot, which I will often write on DVDs, is when she, the, that first time at the end of episode eight, when she introduces herself to her classmates and she's written her name on the chalkboard. And uh, she writes it in English, by the way. And she says, uh, I'm Asuka. Asuka Langley, so are you. Charmed, huh? And uh, the... I, I don't know. I, I have several. I, I know I, they don't want me to really, AJ doesn't want me to go on with a long litany of them, but another one of my favorites was uh, she comes up on, on Shinji, and <laughs> they're, they're, have, they're living together, obviously, at this point, which Shinji is not too thrilled about, but uh, I believe the line was, Hey, why the gloomy face? I'm the most popular girl in school. You should appreciate your good fortune. 
And that just kind of sums up Asuka right there. She just thinks everybody should be happy to know her and happy to be around her. So that's pretty awesome. I mean, I, I, I've i loved being Asuka for all these years. And um, as I was really getting into the show, and I used to like to read uh, some of the uh, the anime magazines that were popular at the time, like An America and uh, Protoculture Addicts and, and so forth. And I, and I remember at some point around this time, like maybe around 97, 98, whatever, I read uh, an, an interview with Yuko Miyamura, the original Asuka, and it was in the back of um, one of the manga issues that had been one of the Tonka bonds that had been released in the U.S. and I read that and I and I actually was brought just a little bit to tears I loved her answers about Asuka and I thought wow that would be so great to meet her one day you know so this was something that I thought about and fantasized for years but it was just like a crazy pie in the sky thing I mean you may as well said like um, I don't know that I was going to marry Brad Pitt on the moon and we were going to fly there on magical unicorns or something. It just was so unrealistic that I would ever meet her or anything. Well, 10 years later, we actually did meet. We um, kind of got set up to make a convention appearance together at Kawaii Con in Hawaii in April of 2008. And... Uh, it was amazing. I was hyperventilating so much that I nearly passed out when I met her because I was so excited. And honestly, within just a couple of minutes of meeting her, she said, oh, I see why you got cast as Asuka. Um, true story. So we just, we hit it off like immediately. We had the Asuka bond, you know. And so as my fantasies over the years had grown about I was going to someday meet her it would go something like oh I'm going to meet her and we'll be like best friends and then we'll go to Pro Land together which is a, like a Hello Kitty theme park um, outside of Tokyo which I'm a big Hello Kitty fan so you know this is all like in my crazy wild going to the moon kind of fantasy and no kidding, at the end of that weekend, as she was like, getting in the car to be taken to the airport, she's like, oh, sometime you should come to Japan and we'll go to Pearl Land together. And I was like, what? And then six months later, I went to Japan and we went to Pearl Land together. I mean, what? It was crazy. And uh, we hung out in Tokyo. And anyway, and so since then, we've done several more conventions together. And, you know, I send her birthday cards and stuff like that. And anyway, so it's it's been, like, so awesome uh, getting to know her and be friends with her. And here's um, just a little tidbitlet for you is um, if anybody here remembers a fantastic fantastic magazine called Anime Insider Magazine. Um, we had done, uh, Miyamura and I had done an inter each inter done an interview with Anime Insider and we had sent them pictures of our trip together to Pro Land. And that article was all set to be published and it was going to be published in what would have been, I believe, the March 2009 issue of Anime Insider. Well, the magazine folded. The last issue was, in fact, February of 2009. So it never came out. And I've always hated that. I just thought, man, if the magazine could have hung on for just one more month, that would have been, people would have loved that article. It would have been so fun. Um, another thing I'm really pretty well known for is my uh, vast Asuka collection. Um, I, I don't know exactly how I started doing that, but it's just cool when there's a lot of merchandise for a character that you did the voice of. Uh, and so I don't just collect Asuka stuff. I mean, I have a lot of stuff for other characters as well. Like, 
I did um, three different characters that were um, Sanrio, you know, aka Hello Kitty related. I did three characters in one of those shows. Um, I collected, you know, quite a bit of uh, figures and merchandise from Infinite Stratos, another sassy German character, Laura, that I played. But yes, I do have a lot of Oscar merchandise. And so when the platinum version of the Evangelion series was coming out around 2004, uh, they tried to come up with lots and lots of extra features, extra content to put on there. And it was the director, Matt Greenfield, it was his idea to feature my Asuka collection on one of the DVDs and call it That Little Red-Haired Girl. So that was his idea to put me on there with my Asuka collection. And that's like 16 years ago now. So there is there is more of it now, <laughs> which is very true. And one of my crazy sort of dreams come true thing is that um, a few years back they introduced a line of of uh, Hello Kitty and Evangelion merchandise. So I have all this merchandise of Hello Kitty dressed up as Asuka. Amazing. It's absolutely uh, incredible. Uh, it's, it is pretty impossible, though, to pick, like, a favorite item. That's a question I do get asked a lot. Is like, do I have a favorite Asuka thing? Um, I don't know. There's so many. One of my favorites is um, I have, uh, they, they made some t-shirts back when they first kind of introduced that whole um, Asuka and Hello Kitty thing. And we were online, um, Matt, Matt Greenfield, he was my husband for a while. Um, anyway, he was online trying to buy me this t-shirt, this Asuka Hello Kitty t-shirt. But it was on a Japanese website and you had to have like a Japanese address or a Japanese credit card or something and he just could not get the purchase to go through. And uh, we ended up uh, contacting Yuko um, uh, and uh, Miyamura and she did it. And she got the purchase and she wouldn't let us, you know, pay her back or anything. So those were gifts from her and I've got had some other Asuka gifts from, from her as well. So those are probably my, my favorite Oscar things like because they were from her and uh you know something that I we got questions about for years myself and Spike Spencer because we talked about it a lot at conventions over the years as kind of a tease is back in probably about 1999 I would say um when Sp Spike was still in Houston he was approached by an ad agency there, somebody that he worked with a lot, to do um, to work on a, a, a PSA, a public service announcement that was being um, commissioned by the city of Houston, where we're both from. And the, it was a, a public service announcement for AIDS awareness and a, um, a hotline uh, that people could call to get information about HIV. So uh, they had asked Spike to do this, and they needed someone who could be the voice of a, a young woman on this ad, and Spike suggested me. So I got a phone call asking me, telling me about what the premise of the ad was. So the premise of the ad is that you can hear these two young people, and they are having a romantic interlude shall we say and then you have the stern announcer which was Jay West actually google him he's an amazing guy he was a DJ for years and years in the Houston area and Jay we produced the spot in his uh, recording studio he's saying like one of these young people is giving the other one HIV can you tell which one you should be tested, use condoms, you know, that kind of stuff. It's a very serious ad. But, um, you know, since it was kind of some delicate subject matter, as in we have to pretend to be romantically involved, um, you know, they wanted to handle this delicately. And I was like, and Spike was like, oh, just call Tiffany. She'll do it. Fine. And uh, so I, so they called me and I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. I'll do it. And we went in there and we recorded it. We were in two separate booths when we were recording the spot. And we recorded it. And then they, like, so proudly presented this to, I don't know, the Houston City Council. I 
I've never really been able to understand exactly who in the city of Houston commissioned this, but whatever. We did it. They listened to it, and apparently they were horrified because we had done such a good job that they just thought it sounded a little too realistic. So it was scrapped, and it was never used. This was not an ad that was ever played on Houston radio, but it has always been my custom whenever I did um, a voiceover, whenever I did a, you know, a radio ad or something, that I would go to the studio and I would get a copy of it. Well, back in those days, I mean, now when I do an ad, they just, you know, email me a link or send me an MP3 file. But again, this is like 1999. So I actually went to the studio and got a cassette tape with this radio spot on there. Again, that was never, ever used. So that was it. So for decades... I was the only person who ever had a copy of it. Spike never did that. He never went and got copies of, I don't know if he got copies of other things, but he never got a copy of that. Well, I ended up moving a couple times and um, it was in a box somewhere. I don't know. But a couple of years ago, I moved and I found the box that it was in and earlier this year, I decided that I would digitize it and I decided that I would, I was approached by this uh, really amazing young lady who has a YouTube channel. Her, her um, name is Red Bard, R-E-D-B-A-R-D. And you should watch her. She did a great video about it. So she asked me a lot of interview questions. And I gave her kind of the scoop to break this story and uh, and she did, and that was back in a, in April. So it's now out there. It's now public, publicly available. Anybody can Google it. Anybody can listen to it. It's not. It is not humorous. It is a very serious ad, but you know it does. It is reminiscent to people of it being Asuka and Shinji, although obviously it's it's not. It is just the same actors who played Asuka and Shinji. And it is from around that same time period. And to be honest, Spike and I worked on several uh, radio commercials together. So it's not like that's the only one we did. We did, we actually did several. I should probably release those too. We did several where we weren't having sex. We did some like for Diamond Shamrock. So uh, we did a lot of other um, ads together too. But anyway, so that's the story of the um, the HIV awareness, the AIDS PSA thing. That's it's not an Evangelion PSA. It has nothing to do with Evangelion except that it was the two of us in there. Um, we did several years later. We got called back into. Um, we ended up doing, of course, the the original end of Evangelion movie and Death and Rebirth, and then um, a few years later, um, the the director's cut episodes of Evangelion which was additional footage that was created in Japan after the original home video release came out um, and then a few years after that Spike and I ended up working on um, <clears throat> on the new uh, rebuild films and uh, of course they've released three of them the fourth one has been delayed because of COVID so the fourth one maybe is going to come out in Japan later this year I don't know and then whenever it comes out in the U.S., I, I don't know. I don't know when or if they're going to ask us to work on it. I have no idea. None of that is decided. None of that is known to me. Maybe it's known to someone, but I seriously doubt it. Um, you know, there, there were a lot of differences, of course, between the original TV series and the rebuild. Uh, it's, it's a reboot, of the show, much like, you know, you have the reboot of, say, Star Trek, for example, uh, with the new films versus the original TV series. Uh, so it's it's a retelling of, of the story. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens in the fourth movie. I have no inside knowledge as to what that might be. I haven't tried to, you know, get, get me a mirror to tell me all the juicy details. I do not do that. So I don't know what's going to happen. And um, it, it was interesting for me in the third film to get to play Asuka as an adult. 
She doesn't look like an adult, but she is an adult. So it, to me, there was a difference with her in that. I mean, she was so over Shinji and his whiny baby crap. Uh, <laughs> um, and of course, in the last you know, year and a half, two years, I have been asked many times about Netflix getting uh, getting the the series and the original movies. Uh, you know, for about five minutes, uh, we were pretty excited. Like, oh, wow, yay, ne you know, Netflix is going to release Evangelion. And we just assumed they were going to release the TV series that, that we had done because, you know, I mean, people like it. So we thought they would release it. They could have released it. They absolutely, you know, owned the um the rights to release it um so they could have they chose not to I will really never understand why it would seem that that is a choice that was made in Japan by Studio Kara and or Hideaki Anno. they have every right to do that so they did it I I stand by our version I think I think we did a good job. We really put our heart and souls into that, and and a, a lot of people connected with it. So uh, I hope that at some point in the future it becomes available again for people. Uh, I think that would be great, you know, maybe if there's a Blu-ray that comes out eventually, but I, I don't have any knowledge about that. Um, of course, over the last 26 years, I've played a lot of characters in a lot of different anime, Certainly nothing has been as much of an impact on my career as my connection with Evangelion, with, with playing Asuka. It's just been hugely influential. It has shaped my life in ways that I could have never really imagined. I, I've definitely spent far more money on Asuka merchandise than I ever got paid for playing the part so I can tell you I, I did not get rich off of it okay um but I, I fully realize it's the reason I'm getting asked to do this interview obviously because it's all about Evangelion and Asuka it's the reason that I get invited to most of the conventions I get invited to when there's not a global pandemic uh, you know and get invited to conventions all over the world um it, it's it's really an amazing honor and privilege for me to be part of something like that that has touched so many people it's um it, it's really it been an incredible experience for me and um certainly one of the greatest honors of my life to to get to play Asuka and I I treasure that very much and I genuinely do appreciate um the Evangelion fans who reach out to me who contact me through email or my Facebook group um, uh, you guys mean a lot to me and I really appreciate the support and that's what I would really like to say to you is that um, I'm genuinely thankful and I know that without the support of fans that we wouldn't be able to do what we do and that's the truth and I want to just tell you that I'm all that I'm very grateful to all of you and uh, thanks to AJ for inviting me to talk to you guys and um, thanks for everything and uh, let's hope for a happy healthy safe 2021 everybody thanks bye-bye